I invite you to have your Bibles handy. We are, uh, once again, not necessarily in a direct passage. We'll be going to several passages this morning. This is our final message on the rapture of the church. Last time we established our doctrinal convictions at Legacy Baptist Church as it relates to the rapture, that we believe that Jesus Christ will rapture his church prior to the 70th week of Daniel commencing, the week that we often call the tribulation, depending on the circle you're in, they don't really like that term. And in our circle, we're, we're certainly comfortable with that term. I was talking last week to some folks, and there's so much more anecdotal evidence of a pre-tribulational rapture. I was talking with someone and we were talking about the feast order. And if you've ever studied the Jewish feast order, there's three spring feasts and three fall feasts. And that feast order, if we relate it to prophecy, uh, the Passover, of course, relating to Jesus' death and the Feast of Unleavened Bread relating to this, 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 uh, this uh, grace, period of grace, of course, pass, uh, Pentecost relating to the church. And then the next thing is the spring feast that comes, that Feast of Trumpets preparing for the Day of Atonement. And so we have that Feast of Trumpets whereby uh, the preparation begins, 10 days later is the Day of Atonement, and then the final feast being the Feast of Tabernacles. If we relate that to... Um, prophecy, then once again, it indicates that that trumpet is prior to the Day of Atonement. Some days prior to the Day of Atonement uh, goes right in line with the pre-tribulational rapture idea. And several other things, anecdotal things like that, that we could look at and say, there's this pre-tribulational foundation that just seems to make sense. And that's what I've been trying to show you, is that doctrinally speaking, as all the tumblers kind of, we look for them all to fall in place, they seem to fall into place with a pre-tribulational rapture theory. Now this week I want to spend some time introducing to you what others think. And as I do so, I, I'm doing so with the desire, of, of course, not to cause confusion, but to let you know where others are coming from. And, and as such, it's in part, of course, I'm going to defend our position from these other views as we walk through them. But I'm also hoping that in doing so, you, you'll assume a graciousness about you. That as you look at these passages that people use to defend their various theories in regard to the rapture, that you'll understand that some of these passages do lend themselves to this understanding within a certain context or within a certain point of view. Uh, that it is perhaps even in some areas of, of rapture theory, um, a different theory's view on a certain passage of scripture might even be more contextually natural. And I hope that that'll help us remember to be gracious with a doctrine that has some level of ambiguity in it. Because this we know, that if the Bible is not entirely clear about something, there's a reason. It's be either because God doesn't need us to know or because God desires us to dig. And so if we can establish with believers some general guidelines that the rapture is a reality, that imminence is a reality, then perhaps the nitty-gritty isn't quite as big of a deal. Now that being said, there are, are, are certain theories I'm not going to touch on today. Uh, basically, I'm only going to be touching on what we call premillennial theories. Only within those that, that would agree with us in orthodox to the extent that they believe that there is a literal millennial kingdom they believe that the tribulation will take place before that millennial kingdom, and they believe that the church will be raptured before that millennial kingdom. And so within that, there are generally four established theories. I'm not going to touch on what's called amillennialism. Uh, gen uh, in, in many reformed circles, amillennialism is a really big thing. Uh, they're called preterists, they're called partial preterists, they're called amillennialists. And these different theories um, all kind of state that God has already done prophecy and that the millennium is not literal and that there is no, no, no literal kingdom reign. And, and so they spiritualize everything. I don't really regard that as within established orthodoxy, so I'm not even going to spend my time on that per se this morning, although there are many very... Um, well-known teachers that would hold to that, uh, particularly uh, R.C. Sproul uh, holds to a form of this. If, if you've gone through the About Legacy class, I give you a, a, a list of those. 
um, that have taught this and have been very influential in the church to this degree. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to hit on the major themes and uh, if I can call it the major proof text or the major the, the proof themes surrounding these other views of the rapture. Um, and as I do that, I, I want you to keep in mind that I am simplifying. There are entire books, many volumes of books written on all of these theories. And so to take any of these and just to boil it down to an hour um, is difficult. And it's never going to fully do justice to the other theories. But I'm going to do my best to not just give a, a shaded or a jaded perspective on what these folks believe, but actually to give you a legitimate understanding of what they believe. And we're going to begin with the, the farthest off from ours, which is what we would call a post-tribulation rapture theory. In consistency with its name, it states that the rapture will take place after the full seven years that comprise the 70th week of Daniel. Now, now one of the strands that unites every theory except the pre-tribulation theory is that they all reject, at least implicitly, that the Bible is organized into distinct periods of time and that there are the, these strong distinctions between God's working in the church and God's working with Israel. So generally speaking, if you are... A, a consistent dispensationalist, then you l tend toward a pre-tribulational theory. The rest of these theories muddy the water of, of the dispensationalism that we presented several months ago as the way that we believe the, the Bible to be or, or ordered or organized, along with uh, this idea, the idea of progressive revelation. So as a side note, many thus do not believe in imminence as we would state it either. They redefine imminence to make it fit within a theory that where there are signs leading up to the rapture. There are signs leading up to the second coming. That when Jesus says, I come as a thief in the night and that no one knows the day or the hour, uh, they have to kind of redefine things in order to fit that into a system where you see Antichrist sit on the throne uh, are on the t in the temple three and a half years into the tribulation, where you see Israel fleeing for their lives, where you see the two witnesses, where you see the 144,000, where you see all of these things coming to pass, where, you, where you're seeing locusts and all of those, right? So they have to kind of try to wiggle imminence into that. But from my perspective, it really doesn't square imminence and these other views, of course, which is why we stand where we do. So most post-tribulation rapture theorists see no distinction between the church and Israel. They, they struggle with the concept of imminence and how to best define it in a way that makes sense. And if you believe that there is no distinction between church and Israel, if you reject dispensationalism, if you re reject the concept of imminence as, as we would state it, then of course this theory has no problems. And there are some elements of the scriptures, particularly as it relates to the resurrection, that lend themselves to a post-tribulational view. So Jesus, um, as he taught in, in the scriptures, and then as we see taught in the Old Testament, and as we see taught in the, Re in the Re revelation of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the dead is primarily painted as something that happens at the very end of time, right? In Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, we read this. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should not deceive the nation, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they, that, and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the worship of God and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So here we have a description of a time after the return of Jesus. Jesus returns, he, he, he destroys his enemies, and after that we see Satan bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years 
after which he'll be released for a short time. Then John sees uh, judges on thrones and he sees the souls, he says, of those beheaded for the, witness, the testimony of Jesus because of the word of God. He describes these martyrs saying that they had refused to worship the beast, his image, or his mark. Now by this we know he's speaking not just of any martyrs, but of those that were killed during the tribulation. They are tribulation martyrs. And the text says that they came to life in a general resurrection and they, they ruled and reigned with Christ for the thousand years that Satan is bound. And the text calls this the first resurrection and says that those have part in this first resurrection are described as blessed and holy, those over whom the second death hath no power, priests of God and of Christ, and co-rulers with Christ. Now, as you think of that description of them, that's the church, right? That's a description of the church. That meets the church in every way, blessed and holy, taking part in the first resurrection, second, resu second death has no power, priests of God and of Christ, rule and reign with him a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. So there is this group of people that are raised after Jesus' return in the first resurrection. Take note, uh, 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 however, that this is also the time that Daniel 12 says the Old Testament saints will be resurrected. So after all of the tribulation, Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2, after all of the destruction, the Bible says that, that as Daniel's looking in the vision, he sees the saints raised from the dead. And so we have this picture in Daniel 12 of the Old Testament saints being resurrected, and they are resurrected after the tribulation. And then we have this picture in Revelation 20 of a contingency of the church being resurrected, and they are resurrected after the tribulation. So we have Old Testament saints, and we have church, and they're both resurrected after the tribulation. So the post-tribulation rapture proponent says this is where the first resurrection happens. The second resurrection is the resurrection of the damned. We see that later. After the thousand years, there is a resurrection for the unjust. And then they are judged, and they receive resurrected bodies that are fitted to destruction. And so there's two resurrections, right? Jesus was the first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15 says, and then they that are his at his coming, and then the, the unjust. If there's only two resurrections, and the church is a part of the first resurrection, well, the Bible is very clear that the first resurrection happens after the tribulation. And so we have a problem, because as Paul talked about the rapture, the rapture says the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together, which means the rapture and the resurrection of the church happen at the same time. And this is why context is important. See, if you do believe that the church has replaced Israel and you do believe in, in just this duality, even if you don't believe that and you just see this duality, well, this makes perfect sense. But does the fact that there is a resurrection of the Old Testament saints at the end of the tribulation, and does the fact that there's a resurrection of a, of, of a contingency of the church mean that everyone has to be resurrected then? And this is where we would say no. We would say that Revelation 20 seems to be quite clear that those that are spoken of being resurrected here as a part of the church are actually the tribulation saints. The tribulation saints who are also blessed and holy, whose second death hath no power over, who are priests of God, who rule and reign with him. This isn't the church. These are the tribulation martyrs. These are the tribulation saints. And that the first resurrection, like we talked about with the second coming, how the second coming, we would say, has two phases, just like Jesus' coming has a first and a second advent. Jesus' second coming has kind of two phases. We would say that the resurrection has that as well. That the resurrection completes, finishes at the end of the tribulation with the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and the resurrection of the tribulation martyrs. But that that first resurrection actually begins at the beginning of the tribulation with the rapture of the church. And again, I'm not going to substantiate all of that this, this morning because we talked about that last week and the week before. We talked about how the Bible can speak of one event, but that it can take place in two phases, right? We've spoken of that on several occasions. So I'm not going to defend that again this morning, but this would be the same defense that we would use to where if we can wrap our minds around that idea of one event having two phases or being over a span of time and calling 
that seven years, the entirety of the first resurrection, as we see the church resurrected at the beginning and the Old Testament saints and the martyrs at the end, that's the first resurrection. If we can get to that point, then we're okay. But can you see how naturally speaking, it's actually more natural to see the resurrection is at the end of the tribulation. But what would that mean? Well, that would mean when the Bible says that God does not judge the righteous with the wicked, that that was a lie because the righteous would be judged with the wicked. That would mean that when the Bible says that God has saved us from the wrath, of come, wrath to come, that would be a lie. That would mean that when the Bible speaks of imminence, that imminence cannot mean what, what the Bible says it means. So this is like we did last week. We go to our deeper doctrines, to the clearer stuff. We build on top of that, and then we say, how can this fit? Can this at all fit? And if it can fit into a consistency with Scripture, and we've proven how that can, how, how a dual resurrection, a dual the idea of, of resurrection the beginning and the end can be one resurrection, how a second coming can span the seven year span and even into the millennium, the day of the Lord. If we can do that without doing harm to the text, then we can maintain a consistency. So that's one of the, the primary proofs that the post-tribulation rapture theorist uses. The second proof that they use in regard to the rapture is found in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, Jesus is teaching, this is one of the primary passages on, that, that, that Jesus gives that correlates to the Daniel 9, 10, 11, 12 prophecies of the end of the world. And Jesus is teaching on it in Matthew 24. We begin with the chronological teaching that Jesus gives in verses 1 through 31. It's going to be a chunk of scripture that we're going to read, so hang with me here. The Bible says this, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So Jesus, they're all bragging about the temple. Jesus says this temple's going to be destroyed. And, uh, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, his disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us what shall be, uh, when shall these things be? When will the, the, these things that you're talking about, these, these future things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So there are actually three questions here. The amillennialist would say, when Jesus answers this question, he is answering when is the temple going to be destroyed and the end of the world going to come as if they're, they're one thing. But in fact, the disciples are asking three questions and Jesus goes straightly, directly to the idea of the end of the world because that's really what the disciples are going for. When shall these things be? The destruction of the temple and all of these other things that are going to come to pass. When will you come? When, what are the signs of your coming? What is the, when is the end of the world? And so verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. We'll talk about this when we get to chapter 6 of Revelation and the four horsemen. All these things are the beginning of sorrows, they're called. And then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall, be, shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved." And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and Daniel makes mention in Daniel 9 that this is halfway through the, the, the 70th week, right? The abomination of desolation. 
whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them which give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. There will be great destruction. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. So that's where the sign of the Son of Man comes in, right? In heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So we have in this account many things going on, right? Um, there will be signs and wonders in the heaven. There will be wars and rumors of wars, then earthquakes and famine and pestilence. Some people say this is prior to the tribulation beginning. Uh, others would say this is during the tribulation. We'll talk more about that in our own interpretation as the weeks go on. Jesus calls these the beginning of sorrows. He says false Christ will appear. Then Antichrist will perform his abomination of desolation. We know that that's the midpoint of the, the 70th week. We talked about that in Daniel chapter 9. Then a time of trouble unlike any that has ever been seen. Then the Bible says Jesus will return and the earth will mourn and the, the, the sign of his coming uh, um, will be as he appears in the heavens. And then he says that he'll send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet and he'll gather his elect. Well, here's a trigger, right? Because we know the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that he will come at the last trump will be this rapture. And so the post-tribulation rapture says he'll gather his elect with a trumpet at, the, at his coming, at the end, this must be the rapture. Then Jesus gives a, clear, a clean break in his timetable as he continues. We're going to finish the chapter, chapter here in verses 32 through 42, and you'll see a little bit more why they say what they say uh, about the rapture. So, verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Once again, the amillennialist says, see, Jesus says the generation shall not pass. But what generation? Does that have to be the generation that's listening to him on that day or the generation that sees the signs? Well, that's what we believe, that the generation that sees the signs will not pass away until they're all fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, Jesus says, but my word shall not pass away. But, the day of, the, uh, but of that day and hour know no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days, as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not that the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. So we see here Jesus speak of his coming, and he says the sign of his coming will be when the clouds part, and he, he comes, and the earth will mourn. And then he says, learn the parable of the fig tree, and as the days of Noah, they'll be eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage. And then the coming of the Son of Man will, um, um, will be imminent, right? The, this idea that, that, that no one knows the day or the hour, and two will be grinding, and one will be taken, and the other left. And um, two will be sleeping, and one will be taken, and another left. So he says, watch therefore. 
So the post-tribulation theorist says this. These verses have a chronological order. Jesus says that his coming will be at the end of all of this destruction and doom, right? That's what Jesus says. And then he says that as it relates to his coming, that his coming will be as in the days of Noah. That that day or hour knows no man. That two will be in the field and one will be taken another left. All associated with his coming. And so since this is associated with his coming, that means that all of this happens at the end of the tribulation. A pretty compelling argument. If we didn't have a whole lot of other doctrinal problems, distinctives, underneath, that would be greatly at risk. You say, well then, pastor, are we proof texting? Are we just taking the scriptures and saying, I'm not going to believe what the Bible clearly says because I want to believe other things? No, right? We're taking foundational doctrines and we're saying these are more clear and more foundational. When I read this in Matthew 24, I have to do something with it. I have to do something with it. So I say, is there a way that I can take what Matthew 24 says and reconcile it with the deeper, stronger, more obvious doctrines? Even, even the day that, that, that the man does not know the day or the hour that the Lord shall come. Even Jesus saying, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. How does that reconcile with signs and one, with all the signs that he just gave? I broke this into Matthew 24, 1 through 31, and Matthew 24, 32 to 42, because what we see is quite a clear break here. Jesus is teaching about these chronological events, and then in verse 32, he says, now learn a parable. There's a break there, isn't there? He says all of these things about his coming and the signs of his coming, and then he says, now learn a parable about a fig tree. Remember that the question was asked at the beginning, what are the signs of the end of the world? So Jesus runs down a list of those signs. But then as he gives this parable of the fig tree and the days of Noah, it doesn't necessarily correlate. It doesn't make sense. If there's going to be doom and destruction and trouble like no one has ever seen, how can it be like the days of Noah? Where people had heard about destruction coming, but then destruction came upon them, right? H how can, if there's been seven years of destruction and, and, and a third of the earth dying and a third of the tree is going away and the, and, and the waters are blood and the fish are dead and the animals are dead and everything's dead and there are stars falling from the sky and the heavens are shaking and the earth is shaking and cities are falling, do you really think that that is going to be like the days, of, I mean, that's not the days of Noah, where people are marrying and given in marriage and tilling in the fields and going about their business as if no, nothing has changed, right? So we have a real contradiction here. Unless the parable of the fig tree is not correlating to the chronological order of events, but is rather a break. There's a break between the signs and the wonders of his coming from chapter, uh, verses 1 through 31, and then a new teaching found in the parable of the fig tree in verses 32 to 42. To this end, there are two different interpretations of this passage that would correlate to a pre-tribulational view that make, I believe, more sense interpretively. First, the first theory is one that I've held for a while, but as I studied this week, or a couple weeks ago when I was studying for the sermon, I actually found myself maybe not quite as on board with as I thought. You've heard me say this if you've heard my teaching for a while. Characteristically, I have linked the rapture of Matthew 24, verses 40 and 41 here, I have linked this characteristically to another parable, a parable of the kingdom that's found in Matthew 13. I'll give you the parable and its explanation, and then I'll explain the link here. In Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30, Jesus says this, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of his householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not uh, sow good seed in thy field? From whence hath, then hath it tares? And he said unto them, The enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go to gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. 
Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them into bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So we have this parable where an enemy sows a field of wheat with tares. Those are weeds. The enemy has done this in order to taint the crop. The servants of the good man ask if they should remove the weeds. Should we go in and pluck up the weeds? And the good master says, no, because I don't want one stalk of my wheat damaged. So I want them to grow together, lest when you pull up the weeds, you will pull up the grain also. So let them grow until the grain is ready to harvest. And then if it comes out with the weed, it's already, it's, it's, it's healthy, it's fine and it's, it's going to be maintained. So he says at the harvest, he says to his servants, first go and take up all of the weeds. Pull up all the weeds, and then after that, pull up the grain and gather it into my barn. Do you see the order there? Gather the weeds first, then the grain. Now Jesus explains this beginning in verse 37. He said unto them, Sorry, I'm, I, I didn't say that. Anyway, verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. So, this is a parable of the end of the world, and it is a parable of the kingdom. And this is where I, I believe that my, my former interpretation was probably wrong because it is a parable of the kingdom. We would liken it to the concept that exists within the kingdom age. But what we find here is that within this parable, the, sinners are, the, the unrighteous are the tares and, and, and the children of the kingdom are the wheat and God allows them to grow together and then at the end of the world, he first gathers the, un, the, the unrighteous, right? and he, he casts them into the fire. And then after he gathers the unrighteous, then the righteous, as it were, shine forth as the sun. Uh, to this end, I, I had regularly interpreted this as the end of the tribulation. That's what I've characteristically done. I've said this is the end of the tribulation. There will be a second rapture, a rapture of the unjust. And within this rapture of the unjust, the unjust will be taken out of this world all those that are not destroyed, and then the just will be gathered. So the idea that we see in Matthew 24 where God says to his angels, gather the elect from the four winds, right? There's a gathering into the barn, but first there has to be a removal of the tares. And that is still a possibility. The parables of the kingdom are debated. But it would seem more likely to me now as I've studied this a bit more that that's actually talking about the end of the millennial kingdom. That at the end of the millennial kingdom there will still be, as we know from Revelation 20, many who do not believe. And so during that kingdom age where Satan is bound, Satan having put the, t the, the, the tares in there from the beginning, where Satan is, is bound, during that, that kingdom age there will be both believer and unbeliever, children of the kingdom and the unrighteous. And at the end of that there will be a removal. One way or another though, what we find is that there is this removal of the unrighteous. And it's possible, and there are some that theorize, again, I've, I've fallen out of favor with this view now, but there are those that theorize that this is the rapture being spoken of in Matthew 24. That if it is a rapture at the end of the tribulation, that it's a rapture of the unjust, casting them into uh, hell to await judgment, while the just remain and enter into the kingdom. My studies lead me to believe, however, that the parable of the fig tree in the days of Noah teach about the conditions before any of these signs and wonders come to pass. In other words, that Matthew 24 verses 32 to 42 are actually teaching about the conditions prior to the signs and the wonders that Jesus gives in chapter 24 verses 1 through 31. That in the last days, everything will be operating like normal, like in the days of Noah. 
They're marrying and they're giving in marriage. They're working in the fields. Everything is normal. Perhaps as well in the, as in the days of Noah, there will be a great apostasy. There will be wickedness. Uh, there will be a no concern for the things of God. And then there will be a rapture in this time of normalcy where some are taken and others are left. So in other words, the disciples ask Jesus, what are the signs of your coming? And Jesus gives all the signs, but then he says, I have something else to tell you. And this something else is really important. And this really important thing is that all of these signs of, of my coming and all of the things that Israel is going to go through in this time, that's all important. But there's something else before that that you need to know about. This is the parable of the fig tree. This is as in the days of Noah, that, that when the figs begin to fall, that's the tribulation period. That's the 70th week of Daniel. You know that, that summer is coming because the, uh, be, uh, that, that summer is already at hand. But when the fig begins to bloom, you know that these things are on the way. And so Jesus says, be looking for this blooming, as it were, the, the beginning and then at the point of the rapture, that's when things kick into gear and then all of the signs will commence. I hope that makes sense. That there will be a rapture in the time of normalcy where some are taken and others are left. And at the point of the rapture, that's like the fig tree beginning to blossom and saying that summer is nigh. We may liken it to the beginning of the true labor pains leading to the birth of a child. Within this theory, then, the statement that, of Jesus that says this generation shall not pass away until all be fulfilled makes sense. Not that the generation listening to Jesus on that day will not pass away, but rather that the generation that sees the fig tree blossom and the figs grow, leading to the harvest or the summer, that generation will not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. And that will be seven years later. So I believe all of this is interpretively sound. That if we take verses 32 to 42 and we subject it to Jesus' timetable, where he says, these are the signs of my coming, but first let me tell you what's going to happen before the signs come into gear. Let me tell you what's going to happen before the signs actually pick up. And what's going to happen before those signs is a rapture. And that is going to initiate then all of these signs. And that generation, that generation that sees that rapture will not pass away until all things are fulfilled. And indeed, once again, Jesus' final statement, watch therefore for you know not what hour your Lord cometh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense if the rapture he speaks of is at the end of all of the signs and wonders that he just taught about. So that's how we deal with this, generally speaking. Jesus is teaching the concept of the rapture, the element of the first resurrection. I spent a long time on this one. I won't spend as long on the next two. The second one is a mid-tribulation rapture theory. Mid-tribulation rapture theory holds that the church will be raptured around the midpoint of the tribulation, approximately three and a half years into the seven-year program presented in the 70th week of Daniel. Now, of any theory where dispensationalism might still hold hold true, where you could hold to dispensationalism and an interpretation, and this one would be it. The mid-trib rapture proponent holds that many of the, uh, he holds many of the same arguments that undergird the pre-tribulation rapture position, but puts different priorities upon the statements that are made about the rapture, and particularly the viewpoint of the last trump. More or less, a mid-tribulation view is an attempt to take the best parts of post-trib and the best parts of the pre-trib and to kind of take, uh, remove some of the problems of both and, and have a middle ground theory. The problem being, of course, that when you try to please everyone, you end up pleasing no one, right? So they don't just assume some, they don't just get rid of some of the problems of both theories. They assume the problems, uh, a brand new set of problems, which just doesn't make a lot of interpretive sense. So doctrinally speaking, we've already focused on this concept of the trumpet. This is really what the mid-trib proponent holds to. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, 
For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So when Paul teaches this brief element of the rapture, he talks about the last trump. We defended this already last week. The last trump in what context, right? But they believe the last trump to be the last trump in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And we've talked about these various signs, right? So we'll have the six seal judgments. And after the six seal judgments, the seventh seal judgment will open the six trumpet judgments. And, and then the seventh trumpet judgment opens the seven vial judgments. And we have found this sort of a progression uh, to be true, that the seals give way to the trumpets. And that seventh trumpet is the last time the word trumpet is used in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. We have also generally, historically, characteristically interpreted the, six, the seven seals and the seven trumpets to be the events prior, uh, of the first three and a half years of the tribulation. And then generally the vile judgments to be the events of the last three and a half years of the tribulation. There is some good evidence that this may actually not be the case that the midpoint of the tribulation might actually end with the sixth or the seventh seal, the opening of the, the trumpets. However, characteristically, historically, the, the, the orthodox pre-tribulation rapturist has seen the midpoint of the tribulation to take place with the seventh trumpet. And this leads the interpreter to this point, to this belief that the last trumpet that Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 15 is the final trumpet judgment which takes place about the midpoint of the tribulation. This seventh trumpet then has historically been considered that midpoint. And because the seventh trumpet judgment is the final trumpet mentioned in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, they say this is the last trump. Now, they agree with post-trib proponent that the church must go through the tribulation. They agree with the pre-trib proponent that the church must be spared of God's wrath. So they were the first ones to define God's wrath as only the second half of the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. And that the first half of the tribulation, the, vi the, the seals and the trumpets are not God's wrath. They are just man's wrath and bad things happening. We would disagree with that. We would disagree with... <laughs> With, with, with several points. But they gather, of course, this conviction of God sparing us from wrath from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. I won't read it to you, but we talked about God delivering us from the wrath that is to come. So this theory tries to strike this middle balance, assuming all of the proofs of the two other theories, but also assuming some of its problems. The mid-trib proponent assumes, as does the pre-trib position, that the first resurrection, the resurrection of the dust, takes place in two phases, one for the church and one for Old Testament saints and tribulation martyrs. The mid-trib position also, however, muddies the waters of a dispensational perspective, allowing the church in Israel to be mixed in this time at a time when the church doesn't seem to have any reason to be there. So the position solves several problems, but it assumes new problems of its own. And to this end, it's not held by very many at all today. It's kind of a theory that, that comes and goes when people are less than satisfied with a pre-tribulation theory. Generally, they end up as a mid-trib. Actually, nowadays, generally, they, they end up as a pre-wrath rapture, which is the last one we'll talk about. And mid-trib is effectively falling away in its interest. And that brings us to the final theory that we'll talk about this morning, the pre-wrath rapture theory. I spoke of it a little bit last week when we talked about the timing of the day of the Lord and how the day of the Lord fits into things. The pre-wrath rapture theory struggles with the idea that the day of the Lord is a span of time. The pre-wrath rapture theory also struggles with the timing of the rapture as it relates to the trumpets and such. And so a pre-wrath rapture theory is very new. It's only been in the last 30 years. Uh, um, I believe his name is Marvin Rosenthal, wrote a book about it about 30 years ago. And that was the first time it had been set in any sort of a systematic fashion. Now there's many people within our circles, many people within our circles that have assumed this position. And the whole concept of the position is, is about the struggle with when the day of the Lord begins. 
the pre-wrath rapture position insists that the day of the Lord cannot begin until Jesus fully returns. And to this end, the idea that the church is raptured prior to the Lord's return is to say that the church will be raptured well before the day of the Lord begins. And this creates an inconsistency with the whole of Scripture. And, and indeed, within this idea, there is a lot of sound reasoning. Throughout the Old Testament, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. It's a day when Israel's enemies will be put down. The pre-wrath rapture theorist says, I don't see a gap between the day of the Lord beginning and the Lord's actual appearance. So if there's no gap, just, just like with, with uh, the resurrection, right? The post-trib folks don't see a gap with the resurrection and the Lord's appearance. So if there's no gap with the resurrection and the Lord's appearance, then we must be post-trib. The pre-wrath rapture doesn't see a gap with the day of the Lord and the Lord's appearance. So the day of the Lord and the Lord's appearance must happen at the same moment then, or else there's something wrong. So all throughout both the Old and the New Testament, the teachings and warnings about the day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night, warnings given to believers that we should be looking for His coming, demand that the believer will be on earth when the day of the Lord begins, right? And since Joel 2, verses 30 and 32 say this, verse, uh, And I will show wonders in heavens and on the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon and blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So Joel tells us that before the great and terrible day of the Lord come, the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood. These are things that happen within the 70th week, right? And these are things that, that Joel says will happen before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Okay, so the day of the Lord can't begin, as we mentioned last time, until after these things take place. Well, that creates a big problem. If the day of the Lord, if the rapture initiates the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord can't take place until after these signs and wonders, then we have a big problem. Thus, it must be that the church is raptured after the tribulation, or after... Uh, certain a aspects at least, before, uh, after the, the, the moon being turned into blood and sun shall be turned into darkness and such. And the first time these things are mentioned, including the first time the word wrath of God is mentioned in the Bible, is at the sixth seal. The loosing of the sixth seal, the heavens are, uh, uh, the heavens are, are rolled away, the earth shakes, there's uh, the moon being turned into blood, the sun is being darkened by smoke, and they, the people say, they hide in caves and they say, hide us from the wrath of God. And so the pre-wrath rapturist says, that's the point that the Bible says must first take place, the sixth seal before the day of the Lord begins. And since that's the point before the day of the Lord begins, then that must be the point of the rapture as well. So they, uh, uh, they, they say that the, the sixth seal is the rapture. And then if you looked at the... Um, chart here, they believe that the sixth seal actually takes place after the tribulation, and then the Lord returns, and the Lord is on the earth for some period of time, maybe a year, two years, three years, and during that day of the Lord time, the church is raptured, Jesus comes back, and during, while Jesus is on the earth, the trumpets and the vials take place. And then Armageddon is at the end of that period. Now, there are some variations to this pre-wrath rapture theory, but basically the wrath of God does not actually take place until the trumpets and the vials, and the trumpets and the vials take place um, after the Lord's return. And this is what the pre-wrath rapture theorist believes. Again, there's a lot more to it, but they are trying to reconcile this. And, and what does this do? This reconciles a lot of things. It reconciles the day of the Lord. It doesn't reconcile the, the resurrection problem, though, does it? Because there still has to be a, another resurrection before the millennium for the tribulation uh, martyrs. I guess unless you assume that everyone is taken there, in which case there's no believers here, and then there can only be one resurrection, Old Testament saints right here, tribulation martyrs right here, church right here, everything happens right here, so you can solve the resurrection problem. And you can solve the day of the Lord problem, and it seems to solve a lot of problems. So we solve all of these problems, right? 
and it seems as though these things fit. What the post-trib couldn't do in solving the problem of, uh, of um, the, um, goodness, what problem, what problem does it solve for them? I guess uh, the, it solves the, what the post-trib hold well, which is the, the two resurrections. Well, no, now we only need the one resurrection. And then it solves the problem that has constantly plagued the pre-trib, which is this idea of the day of the Lord and when it begins. All of these things seem to make sense within it. But here's the problem. They have to interpret a large portion of the 70th week of Daniel as not having to do with the wrath of God not having to do with the judgment of God. Why? Well, because we will not go through wrath. We know that. God does not judge the righteous with the wicked. And so these six seals, he says, have to be the judgment of man upon man, the wrath of man upon man. It, it, it can't be the wrath of God. This doesn't really make sense. When Jesus is the only one worthy to open the seals, when Jesus is the one who opens the seals, when with each opening of the seals something happens on earth, it's hard to argue that that's not God's judgment. It's hard to argue that that's not God's wrath. Also, of course, it rejects dispensationalism. It acknowledges that it, it redefines wrath to say that the church will not face it. They insist that the church must go through the tribulation because of verses such as John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you that ye might have peace. In this world ye shall have tribulation, but be a good cheer. I have overcome the world. So they say, see, the church must go through tribulation. It just won't face God's wrath. Well, yes, but the church has been going through tribulation for the last 2,000 years. Just because we sit in our comfort in the Western world, in the United States of America, does not mean the church is not going through tribulation. Talk to a believer in Syria and tell them that God needs them to go through the, the tribulation of the end times because God says they'll have tribulation. And they'll say, We're, we've got it. We've already got tribulation. We've already got suffering. We've already got the wrath of man. So we see these distinctions break down. We see the distinction of the 70th week break down. Many proponents of this view outright reject dispensationalism, and many of them outright reject the distinction between church and Israel. There's a, the, the most prominent documentary on the pre-wrath rapture view, the, the pastor behind it outright rejects, he's, an, he's quite anti-Semitic, and he outright rejects Israel as God's chosen people. This is the direction that that theory lends itself. So as we spoke last time, I, I defended how the day of the Lord could begin. We see in 2 Peter, we see throughout that the day of the Lord does not just speak of Jesus' coming proper. It speaks of a time period, an event that we believe is initiated with the rapture and continues, in fact, all the way through the millennial kingdom to when the heavens and the earth are dissolved, according to 2 Peter chapter 2, chapter 3, excuse me. And so if we see that to be the case, then we can already recognize that the problems they're trying to solve are problems of their own making. They're not problems of textual interpretation. They're problems of their understanding. And what you'll find if you read Marv Roven, Roven, uh, Rosenthal's book on pre-wrath rapture is that he stated that he was prior to being pre-wrath. The whole book is, is actually slated toward attacking pre-tribulation rapturism using that as kind of the basis. He doesn't really care about mid-trib or post-trib. He's only focusing on pre-trib. But what becomes very apparent as you read through his defenses is that he really did not understand pre-tribulation rapture position before he switched his position. And he really did not come at it from a, from a position of understanding and of, of, uh, um, of comprehension. Because as you read through it, it becomes clear that he's not even really arguing against the points that we would make. Um, in regard to our theory. And I spend a little bit of extra time on this because this theory is the one that is drawing many people away today. This is the one 
that's drawing those in our circles away because it does answer some questions that have regularly been in the mind of God's people, that have regularly been in the mind about the day of the Lord and when it begins, that have regularly been in the mind about resurrection and how there's two phases to one resurrection and how the Bible doesn't say this explicitly. But I call your mind and recall your mind again and again and again to this reality that this idea that there are things that aren't said explicitly but that are possible is something that was all, that, that the entire New Testament is, right? Old Testament said things about Jesus, about Messiah's coming, about Messiah and his kingdom. And Jesus is Messiah and he came and he said, no, not this time, that's next time. This time there's something slightly different happening, right? There is this, there is, there is allowance within the scriptures for this kind of flexibility. As long as it does not contradict the teachings of the Word of God. So their whole theory insists that the day of the Lord cannot be a time period. It must only be an event. And we've already spoken about how we believe it can be a time period. It denies the two foundational doctrines that we hold very importantly. First, the clear distinction between the church and Israel. Second, the imminence of the day of the Lord. That no prophecy must be fulfilled prior to its initiation. And these documents, or these, these doctrines, excuse me, are, are very important. And they found the foundation for what we believe and what we build upon. And we've sought to find a theory that aligns with these deeper doctrinal and clearer doctrinal truths. And we have found that in a pre-tribulation rapture position. I did not give time to these today again, to make you confused. But the last thing I want to do, it's important, especially for our young people, is just to look at you and say, these other people believe silly things. They have no basis for what they believe. And just believe what I'm telling you. Because then one day you read a book and you say, wow, that's not so silly. There's actually some good arguments here. And then you get confused. And then you get alienated. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for any of you. There are good arguments. I hope I've made them even sound semi-compelling today among the other viewpoints. But at the end of the day, those arguments still fall short of preserving the doctrines, the deeper doctrinal distinctives that we hold to be essential. Church in Israel and the distinctions between them, the doctrine of imminence, and the importance of the doctrine of imminence. On top of this, we see anecdotal evidence in many different places that lend itself to a pre-tribulation rapture position. So that's why we stand where we stand. It's not because there is no evidence to the contrary. As I mentioned last week, it's not because we have some sort of trump card that, that, that is absolutely irrefutable. It's not true. We don't have that. But what we have is maximum certainty that what we can do is we can take those foundational, important doctrines, we can build upon them the doctrine of the rapture of the church, and we can build something that is both doctrinally consistent and that does not threaten these other doctrines. And that's important. Because if we allow our doctrine of the rapture to thus threaten other doctrinal distinctives, then we're working in reverse and, and, and the whole tower of our interpretation comes collapsing down, right? So let's allow, I hope, the Word of God to, as we look at the whole counsel of God, direct our hearts. And as I've mentioned before, maybe uh, you've read up on these things. Maybe you're, you're, you're not in agreement with the church as far as the pre-tribulation rapture is concerned. And as I've said, that's not as much of utmost concern to me except to say that if you agree with us that the church and Israel are distinct, if you agree with us that God has progressively revealed himself and works in different ages in different ways, if you agree with us that the, the, the doctrine of imminence means there are no signs leading up to his coming, then you're living in doctrinal inconsistency if you don't hold to a pre-tribulation rapture position. And that doctrinal inconsistency can go only one of two ways. Either you allow yourself to 
live that way, or you begin to alter your foundational doctrines in order to wrap around some higher doctrine, and we just don't want to do that. My prayer for you today is that this would have been helpful. Next week we'll get back into Revelation chapter 4 and 5, and we'll dig back into the text and continue with uh, God's Word there. And I hope that um, this time could have been said to be profitable, but also um, that it was fair to these other views, uh, though we don't hold them. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.